Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to this presentation on the future of digital bridge asset management. I am Ra'ad al-Saraf, I'm Technical Principal Asset Integrity Management for WSP in New Zealand, based in Christchurch office. Um, just a bit of a little bit about me. So I started my life as a structural engineer and over the years went from bridge design to dealing with corrosion um, on those steel bridges especially. Uh, and now I specialize in bridge preservation and maintenance. So I have pretty much first-hand experience of the challenges from the operational side of dealing with uh, steel bridges. And so whether it's from inspection uh, to development of maintenance plan and its implementation, they understand the challenges that go with that. So today really is a bit of an overview of my vision of how we can refine what we do and bringing in digital technology uh, and maximize its use to, 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 to increase the performance of our bridges by improving how we inspect and manage them. Now, before we start, the presentation will be available in the handout box. And please submit your question in the chat box, which my colleague Sharon will read at the Q&A session later on. Um, so we just, there's a lot to talk about actually today, so we'll just whisk through this. Uh, I'm going to give a brief overview of bridge asset management, what we're going to do, do and what the opportunities are. Our approach at WSP to um, dealing with this. Um, an overview of the integrated digital capability that we have our views of what a digital twin maturity model uh, and what it looks like. Um, learnings, I've spent actually a couple of years just understanding from asset owners, their issues and learnings and, and horror stories and what went good, what went bad with dealing with digital twin. It's all about condition. We'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, a couple of case studies, uh, what's next, and then we conclude and have the Q&A. Bridge asset management. Asset management is defined by ISO 55000 as the coordinated activity of an organization to realize the value from assets. So in this particular case, you're probably all familiar with this image, um, the bridge value in this case from a um, <clears throat> asset owner's point of view is ensuring its performance, level of service during its life. Um, if you do undertake normal expected maintenance, which is the orange line, um, very nice easily trending downwards and at some point in time in theory we'll reach the end of the expected life service life of that structure if you do captain renewal and investment over time you get that little green line little blips of extra expenditure and the purpose of that is you're going to extend the life of the structure through a uh a longer period of time and of course the big question that we always have well i don't have the money now what will happen if i reduce maintenance well of course you're going to have a reduced level of uh, expected life and in-term service so it's, a, it's a quite a big balance that we need to understand and go through but um the one thing i have is actually i don't ex agree with that end of life um reaching at the bottom because in reality if we maintain our structures we should be able to extend the life indefinitely unless of course they've been a change of level of service um, whether you need to make it wider or add a pedestrian bridge or whatever so but we can all deal with that so the aspect what we're looking at really again this is what the overview of uh, bridge asset management you have from the strategic uh, asset management uh, risk management framework and then all the little bits at the bottom here which is where the operational, this is where we come in, this is what I do. Uh, a lot of uh, my colleagues here in New Zealand do as well. Um, and we go from the whole inspecting bridges, understanding what's going on with them, coming up with maintenance plans, uh, apply for funding, secure the funding, undertake the work, uh, what to do with the QAQC. There's all the different option, um, opportunities of bringing it all together and that's where digital really comes in and, and, and that's that's what we're going to be talking about the opportunity there so our approach um well our approach is to build um based on our deep domain expertise we have a number of subject matter aspects experts in all stages related to all stages of the asset life cycle um, so we're combining now the strategic asset measurement component with the deep domain expertise and bringing digital to put it all together to have a more effective way of um, managing our assets. One thing I want to talk about is our integrated digital capability. Now, digital twin, a term, everybody talks about it. Digital twin, 
BIM, 3D models. Um, I get, <laughs> when you talk about digital twin, for me, it's not about a model. A 3D model, um, as you can see here, hold on, let me just get that laser pointer going. See in this component here? It's one aspect of a large component of what this could be. <clears throat> it's just one thing. It's all about how do things talk together? What type of data do we have? How do we visualize it? What type of software you need? That is the digital twin. That is the opportunity there. It's not about, let's build a 3D model. And that's what we talk about here with a digital twin maturity model. So when we go to our asset owners, we usually say to them, where are you on that level? So most asset owners are probably still here, level zero to one, if you're lucky, 0 0.5. Level zero is <clears throat> pen and paper data. Um, someone, oh, talk to Bill. It's all in his head. He knows what's going on. Well, what happened when Bill leaves? Or what happened when your files got lost? Um, it is getting better. Um, people are using Excel, SharePoint, things are improving. But to come to a asset owner and say, you need a 3D model, which should really, in our view, is level two, um, that's a big ask. That's a big jump to go from here to there, very expensive jump. So, you know, the whole aspiration is, we, yes, we do end up one day with a 3D model with the ability to tie that information down to member-specific. Uh, if you wanted to, uh, to then adding sensors, AI, that's all doable. But we just have to be careful from going to an asset owner and say, you need to do this. Because talking to them, this is what they had. They, they came to, uh, to me and say, look, they've had it before. They've heard it before. Uh, uh, proprietary asset management software have limited capability. Because in most cases, some cases, and hopefully it's changing now, um, it's called developed by an engineer software developer. So, you know, usually costly to purchase and set up with an ongoing maintenance licensing fee. They're difficult, expensive to modify to suit an asset owner's needs. Um, every asset owner has their own requirements. They may not require this whole suite of modules of, of items that it can provide at the moment, or they want to modify something that may not be as easy to do. I've seen cases where they're just collecting data for collection's sake. You've created this data-hungry beast, and it's like, well, what do you do with this? You really need a clear understanding of the purpose of the software. Um, if there are possible integration compatibility issues. Having the, the software ability to talk to each other is, is really important. Um, there are the risk of intellectual property. You know, where did the data sit? That is, every time you know, we, we keep hearing it. Where did the data sit? Is it whose server? Is it my server? The client owner? The client server? My server? The software provider server? Who's paying for this? So, where that data sits is a very big question. And so what we're saying here is and all about the data. It's all about the data. It's all about the right type of data. And it's also about the condition. And so what we're saying, what we're, when I go, for me, it's all about condition. I can go out, look at a bridge. All of us can. If, if you're an experienced asset manager, you, you've done this for a while, you can go look at a bridge and say, that bridge is fine. That one, I think it needs just happening to it on such and such time frame. And then we can add, you know, we can paint it, fix a leaky joint, whatever. Um, but how do we collect all that information? How could we digitize someone's thinking um, to come up with those answers. But once you have the right information, the right condition data assessment, you can, from that, be able to develop, you know, life cycle models, um, put business intelligence and analytics and analyze the data, come up with a management, asset management plan and reporting all that. So we're going to go through that by a couple of examples. So the first one is a, uh, basically the development of a network bridge digital twin and the second one is a large bridge specific digital twin so wairoa district council is a little council in new zealand little red dot um, and uh, like a lot of smaller local authorities um, they typically have limited annual maintenance budget now Again, you cannot go to someone like that and say you need a 3D model of all your bridges because the majority of their bridges are simple, you know, simply supported, single lane, 
uh, brick structure. The most complex thing is probably an undertrust like that one. Again, relatively small in the big scheme of things. It's not the Auckland Harbour Bridge or Sydney Harbour Bridge, you know, one kilometre or more. Um, these are relatively smaller. The biggest one is around 100 metre um, span. So how do you develop a an asset management plan for 50 bridges, which are spread out the district. Um, you can do it the old fashioned way, um, where you go out and look at every bridge and you spend a little, quite a, one or two or three hours on each one, trying to do a detailed inspection, understanding, um, or you can do it, the, which takes a lot of time and money, uh, or you do it from the top down approach using strategic asset management um, with theoretical deterioration models that may be okay, or it may uh, underrepresent or overrepresent the, the risk. So they may end up spending too much too soon or too little too late. So what we've done, the challenge to me was, what type of information do I need? How can I refine the process? And how can I do it without me going out? But actually it's easy enough that I can train someone who then I can just roll it out throughout the country. So like many things, we build an app. Um, we used ArcGIS in this case, field maps, which was the uh, image here. And the inspectors, when they're on site, they just click on the red button, get the, the relevant bridge. It's all been pre-populated. Um, and then it goes to survey one, two, three, and it asks very specific questions that are required. And of course, when you get that information, you can press a button at the end and it generates a nice clean report. <clears throat> Now, and this was the challenge for me, it's like, what information do I need? So I did what we usually do, you know, look at, in this case, we're looking at protective coatings and developing a coating management plan for all 50 bridges. The question was, okay, what do we do? Uh, we look at the coating, what type is it? Which is not easy to find usually on site, especially the, the, the usually in New Zealand, we stencil the coating on the abutments, uh, what was actually applied or maintained, sometimes it's not, most cases it's not there. Uh, so we did, you know, like coating type adhesion, um, coating thickness, a type of corrosion breakdown. These are all information that is useful to develop a maintenance plan, a refined maintenance plan. But then actually in the end, I came up to, f I actually only need four, four pieces of information. What's the extent of corrosion? Um, what is access for maintenance? Because access for maintenance is 50% of the total cost of a job. So it's a big driver. Containment. That's another big cost factor to around 25%. And is there significant corrosion that stru stru structural criticality is at risk? So those are the, actually, so in the end, I found actually, I just need those four information. Um, and from that, I develop a decision tree flowchart where based on the info you have, I can quickly stream through the information. So once that the team, they arrive, you know, on the app, put, 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 put it all there press send, goes up to the cloud, the screening process happens. So when it comes to me on my desk, on my screen, it's already been screened for me. It prioritizes which should the at risk hot and, and you know which is one I should keep an eye on now, uh, which should the more at risk. And it goes down to this bridge is gone, just replace it, there's no point in trying to save it, to actually you need to have a think about this one, you know, you can develop, develop a plan or, uh, you know, what you need to do. So the screening has been done. So it allows us to focus quickly on where the problem areas are and how to develop that. We also, uh, of course, you have a dashboard. Again, a lot of people have that. This is again using ArcGIS, so it's off the shelf solution. Um, <clears throat> get your analytics. But in this particular case, what we ended up saying to the client now is actually in the next five years, you have the following bridge you need to take care of. You know, you have to replace that one, paint that one, or do this thing to that one. You know, the, then the following other five, 10 bridges of the next 10 years. We also add cost to it, um, cost to the different type of remediation options, whether it's spot repair, spot overcoat, full remove and replace, to include the cost of replacing the bridge. So now we have a bit of an overview of screening through these 50 bridges. That inspection to do all 50 bridges took us less than a week uh, for two teams to do. But because we've auto semi-automated the process, it was much more efficient um, to go through the information and quickly narrow down to the at-risk bridges. But the lesson here is you need to identify the right data to collect. 
you can build an easy to use tool to collect, store, interrogate the data. You don't need to start with this big, massive behemoth of a, you know, uh, attempt to deal with all the problems in one go and, and a 3D models and whatever. Start small. Little red dots are fine. And keep it simple. The next step is here, well, what about the case when you have a big bridge? And Auckland Harbour Bridge is an example of a big bridge. So whether it's Auckland Harbour Bridge, you know, Sydney, Golden Gate, uh, Fourth Bridge, these are big bridges. They, yes, they deserve a 3D model because they're complex um, to manage. So the Auckland Harbour Bridge, for a little bit of a background for the bridge nerds, <clears throat> The Trust Bridge was built in 1959, original four lanes, which was the image on the left. And then the extensions were opened in 1969 that added an extra four lanes, and they're on the outside of the bridge. Um, this is one of my bridges. Um, I have to manage the coating or maintenance on that bridge. So I have 125,000 square meters of external surfaces. And now we're looking at dealing with internal surfaces. And you probably saw my um, other webinar the other day about how we're dealing with the internal surfaces, um, where we're developing our variable demodification. That's another huge, you can watch it on YouTube. Um, it is around one kilometer long, navigation span around 244 meters, and currently managed by Auckland System Management Alliance, which consists of the client Waka Katahi, New Zealand Transport Agency, uh, Fulton Hogan, Heb, uh, WSP and Becker. Okay, so in this particular case, we started with how could we de <clears throat> let's develop a defect tracking system. So we have a structure engineer, they go out twice a year, they look at the bridge, they um, find the uh, defects, a little bit of rust, a little bit of section loss, whatever it is. The problem we had is how could we better capture that information so it de doesn't get lost? So we develop uh, doesn't get lost in the system, making sure that the maintenance uh, plan or program has been included, that the work has been undertaken, and the QAQC documentation has been captured and has been closed out within the relevant time frame. So as a minimum viable product, we just say, let's develop a defect tracking system. And again, we're looking at developing an app to capture the structure inspector's observation, very similar to what I showed you before. And it's all about the ability to interrogate, quantify, and visualize where the defect is. Because of such a big structure, I need to know where those defects are, because that will affect how we develop our maintenance program and how we deal with them. You don't want people jumping from span one and then go to span four, go back to span two, jump to span seven. So by having a heat map of where, this is just an example, where these issues may be, we can then say, okay, we have um, 10 defects here in span one, that is a work package. Hey guys, go do it. We've justified the expenditure. And then it's all about, so we develop an optimized maintenance program from that. But also it's allowed us to refine the over maintenance plan of the bridge overall, because if we suddenly decide, see, start seeing tr a trend over time, for example, of an increased corrosion in particular span, we may say, ooh, that area, we, we may need to look at it sooner than later, span seven. Okay, we're gonna bring that work forward. So that's gonna be uh, next year or 2023, and we're gonna do X, X amount of square meters, and this is how we're gonna do it. <clears throat> The, not, the other thing I'm really, really hot on is, yes, the, we've done a great work. We have a great spec on how to do the work. We know when to do the work. The people do the work. But, and this is common in our industry, it's like, well, hold on. You've done the work. Where's the QA, QC documentation for the completed work? Where does it sit? Oh, it's on a folder somewhere or it's in SharePoint. But where is it? You know, so having the ability to capture the QA, QC documentation of the completed work and the ability to retrieve it when you want to in the future is, is a very big deal. Um, again, it sounds simple, but it's very surprising how a lot of people don't actually, it's not done. I also wanted to add a sign of procedure that start from the inspector identifying something all the way through the different people who would deal with this and, you know, from the delivery manager, us coming up with a plan, the, the workers doing the work to the asset owner saying, yes, this has been completed. I've seen, so it's the QA process of the whole, yeah, QA, the whole process itself. 
<clears throat> the asset owner is in full control of the development process at all times, and that's very, very important. So we're not just giving them a black box and say, here you go. They are part of that journey. You know, they, So we're developing it with them. They say, yep, I'm happy with that. Um, and honestly, that didn't take, cost that much money to, to build because we're starting small and going big and taking them along with the ride with us. And we're really developing building of a solution that is fit for purpose and develop at the asset owner's taste. Um, again, I've had stories where it's, if they end up paying one or two or whatever millions of dollars and then you're like i don't know what to do with this i don't know what the point of it while we're starting small and then we can just progressively build upon the develop tools until a full digital twin is realized look if your asset owner had millions of dollars to spend go for gold um if you can you know justify and develop it but it does actually worthwhile doing it in stages and then you, you, you need to demonstrate the benefit and then the value of it, and it makes it easier to grow. So by the time you have a full digital twin, it's fully functioning, everybody knows what's going on, everybody knows it's function, and it's easy to, to implement it. So what's next for us? Um, from network DIBAM, so digital bridge asset management. So this is hopefully what I've been talking about here is the different modules aspects of it. Um, but, okay, so we have the little bits of information, what do we do next? So now it's all about growing. So like that coating deterioration uh, condition app that we've developed, I'm really keen to add other deterioration mechanisms. So I always, I envision at some stage we're gonna have a maintenance activity over time. So you can say, I need a joint replacement, coating refurbishment, deck waterproofing, so forth. And when you look at it like that for a particular bridge, you can then say, actually, I can lump these activities together. Can I push this activity a year or two, or shall I, can I bring it forward? Because by then you can say, oh, I'm gonna have access then, I'm pending all that money. At the same time, when I'm painting the bridge, I should do my joint replacement, I should waterproof the deck. And that way, that does, it just refines the maintenance um, activity um, and save overall costs over time. It's also easier to justify capital renewals and expenditures because now you know what's the condition of the item, you have, you know when you only need to do it, you know how much it costs, you can go back to your client, the asset owner, the treasury or whoever, and say, I need to spend this amount of money. And they're like, yep, yeah, go, for, go for it. And this is why. You then you issue and track your maintenance work order, you oversee the delivery, you capture the QA, QC, and that's what I mean by digital bridge asset management. We are digitizing the whole process. What we're building is the framework that connects all of the different activities together. That at the moment, sometimes I see are uh, done by individuals uh, in a little bit of a silo mentality. You have the strategic people by themselves. You may have to, they may talk to the risk people, the operational people doing stuff. But it's really about connecting all of that together because once you've connected all, that's when the, the opportunity happens. You're able to refine the process. You know, it makes it easier to. Um, you know, identify savings and optimize your assets overall. So in conclusion, it's really about start with understanding where the asset owners are, um, listen and understand where they are on the digital twin maturity level and what are their aspirations. Work with them to um, get there. Use deep domain expertise, you know, subject matter experts. I'm not just talking about bridge engineers and asset owners, you know. Um, you know, I specialize in corrosion durability of steel structures. We have others who are specializing in concrete and cement durability and, uh, you know, it's refurbishment and so forth. By, so talk to the right people to be able to say, what exactly the data do I need? You don't want to collect a lot of data just for collecting sake. You need to get the right data. Start with a minimum viable product, start small and go from there. So really by understanding the actual condition of a bridge structure, combined with the developed digital solution, it allows for the identification and selection of an optimal bridge specific management plan. This in turn, is, uh, you develop it, you implement it, it's feeding to the, either the singular bridge, the, the singular bridge, uh, big bridge digital twin, or feed into a network wide digital twin. And DIBAM really is the process. So the future of bridge, um, asset management is digital, in my view, um, which again, 
I just called it DIBAM. Thank you. Thank you, Red, for a fantastic presentation. So before moving into the Q&A period, I would like to remind attendees to enter your questions in the question box on the GoToWebinar platform, and also you can download the PDF version of the presentation from the handout box on the dashboard. I will start with the first question. Have you considered the use of drone technology, technologies to further automate and enhance inspection data collection processes? Yep, yep. So we, we um, I spent a bit of time with drones and I realized not dro all drones are the same. But yes, um, having the ability to have drones, to be able to capture data, doing photo, um, what, what is, what's the word? Photo, make, make a, oh, I can't pronounce it now. Um, where the, where the, photo, uh, the, the drone and the images stitch all the photos together, you get a 3D model, all the way down to LIDAR's uh, thermal imaging. Uh, we've been playing with that, uh, detecting delamination on concrete piers. Yes, drones are great. Uh, but again, it's making sure you have the right setup, um, <clears throat> and you're collecting the right information for the purpose of what you want to do. But yes, yes, we are looking at drones. Thank you. Do you have a preference for a particular BIM software or a particular software provider? No, not really. Um, what I like about, so DIBAM for me is the framework. We're software agnostic um, because look, we can go to some asset owners and say, we are using Bentley system or um, Esri or whatever, that's fine. <clears throat> we can work with whatever software. The magic really is making sure the systems are talking to each other. Um, you can do a lot with Microsoft, you know, SharePoint and Power BI to start with. But at some point, yes, you may end up with a Bentley or Esri or whatever. So, yeah, th th there's no preference for me as long as we can talk to them and they talk to each other. It's all good. Thank you. Can the coding condition app be used in other countries? Yep. Yep, so it is based on, <clears throat> when we talk about the coating con condition and the uh, assessing it, that was all based on uh, AMP, used, used to be known as NACE guidance, uh, whether it's extent of corrosion, deterioration, all that, that's all good. But like I said, what I found is the information that's really, really critical for me is access for maintenance and containment. And I've actually provided uh, guidelines of how to rate these. Once you understand those, that really dictates what happens because it's all about the dollars then. But technically speaking, yes, the app is usable whatever you, wherever you are. Thank you. Uh, next question is, in your view, what are the challenges with implementing a digital twin, whether on a network or on a specific bridge? Um, I would say the first challenge is... Um, Either, either it's misunderstanding or underappreciating the complexity of building a digital twin, especially when people will suddenly go from a level, you know, a, a 0 0.5. So they're, they're going from, let's say, Excel uh, and, and files on a, on a server, and they suddenly tell you, I want a, uh, a fully 3D modeled down to individual members. That, that's a big jump. That is doable, but it's very, very expensive. And if you're not careful, you may end up spending a lot of money with a lot, not a lot to show for. And that's the, been the experience. Like I, I've have, I have asset owners who are like they've spent millions on a, on a system, and now the system is on Windows XP in the dungeons of the peers because no one knows how to use it. This is a very old example. Um, and I appreciate that modern systems of software are much better than that, but that's how people have been burnt. And that's why my recommendation is start small, start with something that they can understand. And and, they, and again, where that data sits is one of the, one of the biggest things I found as well. Um, I've, I've had jobs that pretty much everybody was ready, the money was there, and then it fell apart about where did the data sits. So, Understand the the you know the IP issues, uh, having a clear scope of work, a clear targets and outcomes you want is really really important. If you have that and the money is there and the people are there, yeah, it should be a relatively straightforward exercise. Thank you. Just cautious of the time, I will just read the the last question. What subject matter expert does WSP have in house compared to other asset management providers or consultancies? Yeah, so um, that's a good one. <clears throat> so, 
so like, like uh, we do have quite a few people who specialize in structural steel, uh, durability, corrosion, and management, and all that. We have people related to concrete. We have people who do related to uh, uh, you know plastic, stainless, whatever. But the, yeah, so so we do have those, and I appreciate that other consultancies um, have them to a certain degree. Um, in New Zealand, I think we are the only one who had that in house. But the, the magic is the ability to from a material point of view, we then talk to our structural engineers, to our asset owners, um, asset managers, to the digital team, that multidisciplinary the ability to have all these different people and disciplines and they can connect together and develop such tools uh, is really cool. Um, but yeah, we're, and, and we're all over the world. I mean, we're all over the world as well nowadays. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much, Ryan, for a fantastic presentation. So thank you everyone for joining today. We are at the end of our webinar session and please feel free to follow up directly with Ryan via the contact details shown on the screen for any question that you may have. And thank you everyone uh, for your time. I will wrap up the webinar now. Thank you. Thank you.